morning. Good morning. The Lawnsdale United Methodist Church. It's so good to see each and every one of you. Good morning. Good morning. Lovely Lawnsdale. How in the world are you? Brother Fred, how you doing? God bless you. Uh, you may be a few miles away, but you're real close to our heart this morning. Amen. For praise this week, the church recognizes the efforts of those who prepared food for the distribution by the food pantry on Thursday, and also for the clothes that were given away on Saturday. There was also a lot of camaraderie that it experienced by these events, and we also thank the help of Fellowship Church. Happy birthday to Jimmy Thomas. Carol Latimer's daughter celebrated her 40th birthday, and Lisa Blank was thankful that she got to go visit her brother in Hawaii. For prayers of intercession, we ask for prayers for Americans still stranded in Afghanistan. Please continue to pray for Lois Harbin's grandson-in-law, Morgan. He is still recovering, but his kidneys are functioning, and he is breathing on his own. Concerning COVID-19, please remember to be mindful on this virus. For healing, for Phil King... Debbie Gallagher, and remember Amanda Hodge, who lost an aunt and an uncle to COVID-19 this week. Prayer request for Lori Whitson for a severe back injury, for Linda Jones, for the family of Lance Outlaw, for James Burnett, for Clyde Braden, who will be undergoing medical tests, for Doug Kyle, who is suffering serious illness, 
for Lois Harbin for upcoming medical procedures. Karen Buckner's brother will be traveling. For Amy Everett. For Donna Vandergriff. For Jenny Cardi. And our Martin Chapel family, Monique Johnson. Thank you. Amen. And thank you so much. You, you all are helping me to preach the sermon that will be coming up in a few minutes. And it is of someone to care. It deals if I could help somebody. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you've blessed us this morning to be here. How you've brought this number out on a day that's kind of gray, but we know it's bright in here. And we thank you for the multitude of blessings that you have brought to us in various ways. How you've touched our hearts, how you blessed me this morning to send two cherubs to encourage me to do the work of the Lord this morning. Lord, how you've blessed us to make it through a week that was taxing but rewarding. Now, Lord, we turn to the side of life that's difficult for us. And just as you've blessed us in righteousness, we ask that you would bless us in trial. And we pray for help and strength as we seek to battle this coronavirus. We pray, Lord, that the family of Sergeant Ryan will be comforted as they move toward Arlington. We pray this morning, Lord, that those who are dealing with pain and suffering, injury, will find rest, comfort, and healing in you. We pray for those, Lord, who are waiting next week for a diagnosis or a prognosis or a treatment that would bring them back to full health. We pray for those health care givers, that you will bless them. We pray for the patients, that they will be handled with dignity and gentleness, and that their health will be restored, and that some who are not with us today will be with us in the future. Those who are here, Lord, who are dealing with pain and suffering in their bodies, we pray that the virtue of healing from heaven would fall upon them. Now, Lord, we pray that as we go further in worship this morning, that we would truly be blessed by the word of God. And we thank you in advance for your blessedness toward us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you each and every one of you. I want to say a word to our worship team. Um, I don't know who's the hymn picker, but you tend to do a wonderful job. There, there's a message in the music, and it puts inspiration in our hearts, and it's done to coincide with the scripture and the sermon. And I can't speak for y'all, but it's a blessing to me. So the worship team, we appreciate you this morning. Amen? Amen.
They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant to all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I was just a little fellow, and my mother and my father and my uncle were talking. And somehow or another, I got the notion that they were talking about me. And they said something like this. My uncle suggested, you need to go ahead and take him to the doctor and get his tonsils out. He won't have as many colds. And I was kind of like the disciples this morning. Something about that didn't sound right. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't know what a tonsil was. Not too real sure now. But I knew for them to take it out was going to involve something sharp and shiny and painful. And I didn't even want to ask them about it. Because you know why? I was scared they was going to tell me the truth. And I didn't want to bring it up again. And then one day, just out of nowhere, I just busted out crying. And they said, what's wrong with me? I said, I don't want my tonsils out. I said, oh, we hadn't thought about that. You're not having any problem. I was so relieved, amen. But I didn't want to ask them about it because I was afraid that they would tell me and then go ahead and schedule whatever was necessary to have that part of my anatomy removed. Today, we're looking at Jesus going to a solitary place to teach and train his disciples. Now we should note that Jesus thought that moving forth with evangelism, moving forth with outreach, moving forth with mission, moving forth with kingdom building was not something that you would do just haphazardly, but training was necessary. Amen. And so as he was training them, he was showing them their need for preparation. I am going into the city. I'm going to be handled roughly by some mean men. And I'm going to be executed. The Bible says they didn't get it. The Bible said they were afraid to even ask the question if I could help somebody. Now, I'm going to assume that they heard Jesus speak and Jesus speaks and communicates clearly. But they didn't want to hear what he was saying. And I'm going to suggest further that Jesus still, through his word, through his book, through his servants, through his song, through his preach message, is speaking to me and you clearly this morning. But some of us just don't want to hear it. Jesus was telling them what's going to happen and that they were going to have to be sober and vigilant and strong to withstand what was coming their way. But they were distracted. You ever been telling your children something they were distracted? 
Sometimes my mother would be in the middle of sharing something with me, and I'd be distracted. I was usually easily distracted by Mickey Mouse or a honey bun, either one. If Mickey Mouse was on, if a honey bun was around, I was distracted. And sometimes my, my mother, she had a, a rare occasion, she'd have a flare of humor. And then all of a sudden, she would just bust out and say, house is on fire. <laughs> and sometimes I stamp so quick, my pants would fall down. Amen. <laughs> but she got my attention. They were distracted. Jesus noticed that they were distracted. He asked them, what are you talking about? What are you discussing? What are you debating? What are you quarreling about? They admitted we, uh, we weren't listening that well. But we have a concern. When you go into the city and take over the city by force and set up your government, we want to know who's going to be your vice president, who's going to be your general, who's going to be your prince. Who's going to be in charge? What did Jesus say? I'm going into the city to be mutilated, tortured, and killed. What did they hear? What they heard, that they were going into the city to be princes, to be royalty, to be in charge. Who's going to be? the greatest among us. Jesus said, I would rather you have been more concerned about helping somebody. You saw me help the blind man. You saw me raise the daughter that was dead. You saw me raise the son that was on his way to the graveyard. You saw me raise Lazarus. You saw me feed the people. You've seen all of these miracles. I am teaching you how to help somebody. And you're talking about who's going to be the greatest. There's a picture that it's probably still on the internet, but most of all of us have seen it. it. At the time, it got to the front page of most newspapers, back when we had newspapers. And one of the former pontiffs, head of the Catholic Church, got off his special plane and was walking across the tarmac on the airport. And there were throngs of people there children, men and women. They were roped off, barricaded, because to be the leader of a large Christian organization like the Catholic Church marks you as a target for terrorism and for violence and for danger. Suddenly, this pope, and I forget which one, went through the barricades, pulled away from his security group, went out into the crowd, shaking hands, hugging people, and he picked up a child, raised that child up, and blessed that child. He broke away with protocol. At that moment in his ministry, he was not the greatest person in the Catholic Church. His title is Prince of the Church. But that child became the greatest as the Pope served that child. Look at the scripture. As an object lesson, Jesus took a child in his midst. He hugged them. The way my beautiful children hugged me up here this morning. He hugged them and told the disciples that were fussing over who's going to be the greatest among us. 
Who's going to be the person of authority? He said, unless you have the innocence of Suzanne and Frederick, of Carter and Cooper, you're not fit, you're not ready for this kingdom. If I could help somebody. As I go through this world, if I could just help somebody with a word or a song, if I could just help somebody, as the road gets long, if I could just help somebody, then my living will not be in vain, useless. If we are posturing for position, if we are politicizing for a place, if we are pushing for power, our living is empty and is in vain. Who's the greatest? Jesus, I tell you. It's the one who will serve. About five years ago, the United Methodist Church revamped part of its lay structure. We still have lay speakers, lay ministers, but they inserted the idea of servanthood. And now we have certified lay servants. There are individuals who are dedicated to service not to salary, but to service. And they added that to what they were already doing in terms of the title. They will send a message to the world that we came to serve and not to lord over you. When you had those clothes laying out there and, and the rain was coming, that was service. When you was loading up those groceries, that was service. When you was preparing those baskets, those grocery bags on Wednesday, that was service. When you wrote that card just to encourage somebody, that was service. But when any of us in this building are out there in the internet, decide that I need to make a power move. That's for vanity and that's emptiness. Jesus said, choose service. Let your motto be, if I can help somebody, then my living will not be in vain. Is that all right, church? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. I personally thank you that you've put me in a place where people get it. That serving others is also serving you. Whether they're in Haiti or Waverly, whether they're on Galbraith or Catherine, whether they're here or there, that we should fill ourselves with the desire to serve and not to be served. And for that, we thank you. In the mighty, matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Pastor loves you. Dear friend of mine uh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Sister Linda Sales is going to the doctor tomorrow for a, an unknown discussion. Bless her with your prayers. My bride is um, sitting with a church today who's without a pastor suddenly. Pray as she go to bring healing to that community. Some of you know Reverend Martin, who has served all over Holston as DS and pastor. He's in need of our prayers as well. So as Brother Jimmy comes,
the birthday person himself as he comes. He's going to lead us out into the outer garden where we're going to lift our voices and sing our hymn of benediction. Thank you.